Good evening. It's good to have you here tonight. If you will, go ahead and open your songbook to number 340, or you can uh, follow along on the screen, either one. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us tonight. We have a number of visitors with us, and we're always thankful for those of you who are visiting with us. We appreciate your being here. And if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, the Lord uh, gave you this opportunity to hear the gospel preached. And I hope that you will listen carefully and attentively as Brother Jack preaches the Word of God. And when he gets through tonight, if you've got any questions, I encourage you to stop him and say, I want to know a little bit more about that. And I can guarantee you, Jack will say, let's sit down and let's talk. And uh, whether it's tonight or when any other opportunity, and if he's not available, well, the rest of us will be available to spend some time talking with you. Brother Jack Honeycutt preaches for the Willette Congregation in Red Boiling Springs. Uh, he's been there before, and now he's back again, and he's doing a marvelous job preaching for them. Uh, he has had a number of debates. He has traveled extensively on mission work, primarily in India, and we are very thankful that he is with us this week, along with his sweet wife, Becky. She is such a... Uh, makes him look good. And that, is, would you say amen to that? Amen. Uh, at the appropriate time, we're going to have our opening prayer. Brother Darrell Brokey, uh, who preaches for the Sherwood Congregation, will be leading us in our opening prayer. At the end of our services, Brother Bob McDaniel, who is the new preacher at Centertown, will be leading us in our dismissal prayer, and we're glad to have them with us. Just to let you know of a couple of events that will be taking place. Uh, the congregation at East End will be having their Ladies' Day this Saturday, uh, April the 9th. Sister Tish Clark will be their speaker. Their registration is at 8.30. Next Sunday, the Morrison congregation will begin their gospel meeting with Wayne Miller, and it will continue through Wednesday night. Uh, not only do we welcome you who are here with us tonight, but... These services are also airing on Ben Loman TV. Uh, they're a day delayed, so uh, it'll be tomorrow night in which this episode will be aired. But we're thankful for those of you who might be watching with us who can't get out. Uh, I've even had some folks coming in tonight say that they've not been able to attend for a while and they've been able to watch the services here. And we appreciate you for that. Uh, when you're not able to be out and you're sick and you have family members sick, we're glad that this is an opportunity for you to hear God's Word preached. But we want to encourage you and invite you now to open your songbooks, open your hearts, give praise to God, and let's uh, worship together. Brother Stanley. Swiftly we're turning light.
books number 369. Number 369. Jesus, the loving shepherd, call me now to come into the fold of safety where there is rest and room. Come in the strength of manhood, come in the morn of you. Let's go to God together in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, truly, Father, how great thou art. Holy and reverend is thy name, Father. We thank thee, almighty God, for the gift of thine only begotten Son on the cross, that we through him might live. Father, it is our earnest prayer tonight that those in the body of Christ would truly understand the responsibility to take the seed of the kingdom and plant it into the hearts of men and women while we have time and opportunity. We pray, God, that opportunities would open themselves to us, that we might help those outside of the church find salvation before it is everlastingly too late. Almighty God, we pray that thou would defeat the agenda of the LGB movement in this country and especially in our government, Father. We pray that they would be sorely defeated and that the morality of thy word would shine in this country as it has in the past. Our Father in heaven, we pray for the fighting and strife in this world. We realize that it is a reality but, Father, we do pray that through all of the conflict, many souls might look to Thee and find the truth, Father, and find salvation while it is still available to men. 
Almighty God, we pray that you'd be with Brother Jack as he preaches tonight, Father. We pray that the word would fall into good and honest hearts and uh, bring forth an increase, Father. And we do pray that if there are those opposed to the truth, that they would truly listen and look in the scriptures and see whether or not these things are so, Father. We thank thee, Father, for Brother Tony and the work that he does here. We pray, pray, Father, that you would bless him with many more years here in this area preaching thy word. We pray for Jason and the good work that he does. We thank thee, Father, in heaven for the elders here, and we pray that you would bless their efforts, Father, to feed this flock and to have the oversight thereof. Almighty God, we humbly petition thee, Father, to be mindful of us in these dark times in which we live and help us, Father, to have the joy in our hearts knowing that we are citizens in the kingdom above. In the name of thy son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As the Lord's invitation is extended to us this evening, we're going to sing number 454 in the songbook. Number 454, and now we're going to sing number 36, Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Verse 15, what shall I say? Let us pray with the Spirit, and let us pray with the understanding. Let us sing with the Spirit, and let us sing with the understanding. I hope the words that we have been singing tonight have come from our hearts and been pleasing to our Lord. We've had beautiful singing the last two days. I appreciate so much those that have that talent and that ability. If uh, you're watching tonight or uh, listening by way of Facebook or uh, cable TV, uh, YouTube, if you're looking for a congregation, I believe that the Bobby Branch congregation is truly 
a uh, godly church. We've got a good preacher that's proven himself many for many years. Uh, we've had him over at Will Ed on our summer series and always appreciate him, appreciate Jason and the work he's doing with youth. Uh, that is a tough work. It's a good work that needs to be done. Our children uh, need to be led in the ways of the Lord, not only by a youth minister, but especially at home. Like I said last evening, I've got good elders. I appreciate the work that you're doing here. We have seven elders at Will Ed. Two of them asked me today, so how did it go? I said, I finally got to work with some good elders. <laughs> so I'll probably be looking for a job next week. We have such good men there, godly men. Appreciate you being here tonight. I hope that you'll get your Bibles out, follow along with me. It is an awesome responsibility, friends that we know what the Bible says pertaining uh, uh, to especially to salvation. And as I talked about this yesterday morning, we looked at salvation in the fact that we're going to be judged one day. Then in our Bible class, we looked at commitment. One of the reasons that the churches of Christ are not growing today is that we have failed in our being totally committed to God. And we need to do a better job. And that has to come from within. Our families need to be committed to God. And uh, last evening, I talked about the home, the family. I tell you, brethren, Satan is attacking our homes. We need to go back to the Bible. We need to know what the Scripture says concerning uh, the home, uh, the family. Tonight, I want to look at going back to the Bible concerning the church. Now, you might say, brethren, uh, why in the world do we need to hear a sermon on the church? Well, I'll give you a couple of reasons. Peter says, I'll bring back to your remembrance. I want to stir up your remembrance. Number one, we need to be reminded of how valuable the Lord's church is. It was in the very mind of God before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 3, 10, 11. Number two, we have the opportunity to reach a lot of people with perhaps a message they've never heard before from the Scripture. I challenge every person within the sound of my voice tonight not to take my word for it, to open up the Bible and to be able, as the Scripture says, to come and let us reason together. Three scriptures I want to look at before we get into our lesson tonight. We need to be like those noble Bereans. I came out of a religion that believed that when the preacher got up to preach, that he was led and guided and directed by the Holy Spirit himself. And you just sat back and whatever he said was no doubt going to be from God. And if it's from God, it can't be wrong. And I'm afraid that in the church sometimes we've developed the same mentality. Listen to me. As uh, Paul said there in, on Mars Hill in Athens, he said, that, and these were more noble than those at Thessalonica, in that they received uh, uh, the Scriptures, those things that were taught to them, they received it. And daily they searched those Scriptures to see if they were so. We need to be back searching the Scriptures. Our young preachers, our older preachers, I was able not too long ago to speak uh, to a group of preachers and they told me, said, we just want you to tell what you, uh, what an older preacher can tell a younger preacher. And I said, well, that's kind of offensive. I didn't know I was an older preacher, but I had five things. I told them, number one, stay in the book, always stay in the book. I don't care what you've heard. I don't care what you've read. If it's not in the book, don't preach it. Number two, stay humble. I don't care how many mission trips you've gone on. I don't care how many people you baptize. I don't care how many gospel meetings you do. You're a servant of the Lord. And always remember that. I'm not going to tell you the other three because it's getting away from my lesson. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Quite often someone will call the church office. They've listened to us on YouTube or on the radio where I preach every day. And someone will say, you know, I... I really don't understand it that way. I've never been taught that way. And this is this is perhaps just your interpretation, your opinion. And I always quote this scripture to him. Prove all things and hold fast to that 
which is good. And the third verse I want to remind you of is 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asks of the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. If somebody asks you a Bible question at work, especially pertaining to salvation and the organization of the church and the basics, and you have to say, Well, let me go see what Tony says about it. You need to get busy and start studying. Brethren, we need to know the book. We don't have to memorize the book, but we need to know the book and we need to know what the scripture says pertaining to our salvation and to the salvation of others. So tonight, I want us to come and reason together from the scriptures. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to open up the Bible. Well, first of all, I want to look at the subject of the church. The Lord has blessed me a few times to be able to preach in various other places. I've been to uh, India, and I was the India coordinator, and I would coordinate. We have 110 churches to support our work that's overseen by the Will Ed elders, and we go various places, do reports, and uh, most of the time they'll ask me to preach, or I'll go back and do a meeting for them, and I'm telling you, brethren, the church of our Lord needs to always remember that the church of our Lord belongs to the Lord. It's not the elders' church. It's the Lord's church. Coming into the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know these scriptures. Some say, yes, thou, thou art uh, John the Baptist, Elias, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, uh, uh, That thou art the Son, uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Do you understand that? I will build my church. And whatsoever you bind on earth, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. For, for quite a while, brethren, I used to say that that church there in Matthew 16, verse 18, when I grew up, that church included all the different branches and uh, that was attached to the vine. In John 15, it didn't really matter what you believed. It didn't really matter what someone else thought. As long as you were sincere and honest in your heart, that's all it would take because we were the branches that were attached to the vine. Well, I misunderstood that passage because uh, the branches are attached to the vine. We are the branches. If we're in Christ, if we're in the Lord's church, we are att attached to the vine. Jesus is the vine. We are attached to him. He's not talking about denominations. He's talking about Christians. They're talking about disciples. I want you to notice what Jesus said. He promised to build his church. I want to break that down for you. First of all, when I'm talking about Jesus, I'm talking about God in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. We're talking about God's Son. We're talking about the very Son of God who left the joy, the splendors, the glory of heaven. He emptied himself. He came and he walked among men, and he had one goal, and that is to seek and to save the lost. And it, what that entails was that Jesus said, I am going to build my church. We're not talking about Joseph Smith. We're not talking about some other man. We're not talking about Martin Luther. We're talking about God who walked on this earth and he said, I will build my church. Notice Titus 1-2. God can't lie to the eternal life that he promised us even before the world began. And he says, and he cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18, God can't lie. Friends, when you find promises of God, a great sermon for us preachers is to look at the promises of God and how they were fulfilled. Promises that were made or predictions and prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. You look at Jesus. Jesus promised. If Jesus promised something because he's God in the flesh, he's going to keep his promise. Notice he says, to build. It's in the future tense. 
When Jesus walked on this earth, he had not yet built his church. Mark 9 verse 1, he says, And I say unto you, some of you shall not taste death till you see my kingdom come with power. The kingdom was going to come in the lifetime of the apostles. It will add, I've been doing a series of lessons on the book of Revelation and talking about uh, the fact that uh, the kingdom is now here, Colossians 1.13, Revelation 1 and verse 9. And it's interesting because most religious folks believe that the church was an afterthought, the premillennial doctrine, that the church is an afterthought. It was plan B because plan A, the Jews didn't accept the Christ. Plan B was uh, that he's going to establish a church, but the church was really not in the mind of God in the very beginning. But one day he's going to come and set up the kingdom Therefore, we've got to protect Israel because all those prophecies that talks about Israel is going to happen one day. Brother James Watkins used to have a Greek word for that, and that's called hogwash because it's not Scripture. The fact of it is the kingdom is now here. The kingdom and the church was the same. If you're listening to this, I beg you to listen intently to this. Follow it out. Read it. Search it. Think about it for a moment. Jesus said, I will build my church. It belongs to him. It's possessive. It's his. Brethren, I tell you right now, I will never, ever in my right frame of mind ever be guilty of splitting and splintering the Lord's church. I'd never, ever want to be guilty of that. This is the Lord's body. Now, I'm going to preach the truth, whether you like it or whether you dislike it. I'm going to preach it without fear or favor. I'm going to be, try to be like Brother Marshall Keeble used to say. He said, I'm going to preach it when they like it and when they dislike it. Why? Because it's truth. It's Bible. It's our soul's destiny is dependent upon what the Scripture says and our obedience to it. So it's his. It's possessive. And then we're looking at the ecclesia, the called out, the sanctify. God has got a called out people. It's the church, the saved. These are very important. I used a little bit of that in a debate that I had, and a fellow got up there, and he said, what Mr. Honeycutt doesn't realize and understand is that the church there is he's going to try to make it apply to, to one church, and he said, that's, that's not correct at all. He said, I can prove that, but he never did prove it, and you can't prove it tonight, that it's talking about various different religious groups. It's talking about the called out, the saved, and I'll prove that to you tonight from Scripture. This is not a sermon that's going to, uh, should not offend anyone because I'm going to give you book, chapter, and verse for it. It's coming from a heart of love and kindness. I'm concerned about the religious world. Are you not? Are you not concerned about all the division? Are you not concerned about all the strife that exists in our world and Satan is no doubt just pleased about it? What are we doing about it? And even in the, among the Lord's church sometimes there's division and there ought not be that. Notice his church is not yet built. One of the arguments that I've always uh, heard in every discussion that I've had is that what you don't understand uh, that Jesus built his church in the days of John the baptizer. And they'll go to Matthew 3 and verse 11 and say, now listen, I'll baptize you with water, but there's going to one come mightier than me, greater than I, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And they allude to Matthew 3, 11 and say that when Jesus got the apostles together, called the apostles together, that was the beginning of the church. But when you get to Matthew chapter 14, John the Baptist's head is on a platter and the church is yet not, uh, has not yet been established. Jesus is still saying that I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. But when you look at Matthew 14, John's dead. So therefore, what we hear some people say is, just, just the other day, I got a message that God prepared a Baptist preacher, John the Baptist, to teach and to baptize believers. Jesus endorsed the message and the baptism of the first Baptist. But what's wrong with that? Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Matthew 14, John is dead. And what is wrong with that is that John the Baptist died before the church was ever established. Therefore, he was never a member of the church. 
He died before the called out, the saved in the Lord's church before it was ever established. How do I know that? Because, brethren, I studied that for a long time. I grew up that way. I know. And I challenge your thinking. This is not being uh, hurtful or mean. Your soul is going to stand before God one day, and you're going to give an account. It's going to be too late to say, well, I didn't understand all of that. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. Yes, it matters. If the Lord promised to build his church, and we're going to see in just a moment where that church is located, and it was not built in John's day, then when was it built? When was it established? Jesus ascends back to the Father. And he tells them in Luke 24, 46 through 48 through 49, he said that I am going to go back to the Father, but he said, I want you to go into Jerusalem, and I want you to tarry there in Jerusalem, and you shall be endued with power from on high. And repentance and remission of sin shall be preached in my name, beginning at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So when you open up your Bible in Acts 1 and Acts 2, it's not a coincidence in Acts 2 when it says the day of Pentecost had fully come. And you read Acts chapter 2, and for the very first time in Acts chapter 2, do you read the church in its present tense? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel accounts, it's in the future. Acts 2, present. Somebody says, no, 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 your church started and, uh, during, the, uh, Reforma- or during the Restoration Movement and you got ties back to this or back to that man. If my ties are back to a man during the Restoration Movement, then I'm in the wrong one. I've got to go back to the Bible. And I'll show you in just a moment how you could do that. Notice what Jesus said, that Hades... The New King James uses the word Hades. The King James I'm using tonight is the word hell. Would not overpower Christ's church. In other words, death would not prevent the carrying out of this noble design on that occasion. Even though Jesus is already dead, he's at the right hand of God. Even though some of the, uh, of the apostles, Judas, is dead, that's not going to prevent the carrying out. And it embraced the promise that Christ's church would never be depopulated by death of her members. Friends, the Lord's church is going to be on this earth somewhere. Ever, ever since Acts 2, it has, and it will be until the judgment day. Now, think about this for a moment. Peter was given the right to, admit, to announce the terms of admittance. You ever thought about that? Here was Peter, the one that had denied the Lord, cursed. I'm, boy, I, I'm, I'm a whole lot Peter. Boy, I mean, just impetuous Peter. Sometimes I speak when I keep my mouth shut. You ever done that? You know, open mouth, insert foot. Peter did that. Very impetuous. Why, Lord, I'd never, never forsake. Well, I'll die with thee, Lord. And the next thing you know, before the, uh, the rooster crows three times, he had denied the Lord. He cursed. I don't know him. And yet, the Lord used this mighty man because of the second law of pardon. He repented, and God used him in a mighty way. Well, how did God use this man? Well, I'm glad you asked that because all you got to do is go to Acts chapter 2 and you see these Jews who thought they were in a covenant relationship with the Lord. That's all they had known from their forefathers was this Jewish religion. They're in uh, the in Jerusalem for this feast day, this Passover, and this Pentecost day. They had traveled a great distance to worship the Lord. They thought was right. God knew in his mind the right time, Galatians 4.4, 4, he knew the right time when to begin the Lord's church. And Peter said unto them, and especially, boy, marvelous sermon. You go down to verse 36, ye men of Galilee, are you men of Jerusalem? Know you not that this same Jesus whom you have crucified, he hath raised up from the dead. And they cried out and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? 
One fella, one night when we was having, having this in a public discussion, he said, he didn't say what to do to be saved. What do you think maybe they implied there? What shall we do? They had just, an indictment had been made on them that they crucified the very Son of God. God had raised them up, and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Evidently, what shall we do to be saved? Because of the answer in verse 38. Here is using the authority that Jesus gave Peter. And he said, repent and be baptized. You know how, how I used to interpret that verse? before I became knowledgeable of what the, the Bible is. This is the way I read it. Repent and be baptized because you're saved. Boy, I'd have argued with you. But the problem of it is I wasn't being honest with the Scripture. Look at it. Repent and, coordinating conjunction, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and you shall be saved. Repent. A change of mind that results in a change of will and a change of action. And coordinating conjunction puts them together. Both of them are equal value. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You know, we got brethren now that say that you don't have to really know what you're doing when you're baptized. As long as you're baptized, it doesn't really matter why you're being baptized because you just obeyed what God said to be baptized. Do you know what the is implied in that statement in Acts 2.38? Knowledge. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, not a few of you, not some of you, not those of you that really think you ought to. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission, for the removal of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how Peter could make that any clearer, do you? Now, you may be listening in days to come, and you might say, well... I don't think he's got that right. Well, you tell me what Peter would have, what words would he have to use to make it right? Repent and be baptized in answer to a question, what to do to be saved. How many of them? Every one of them. Why? For the remission of sins. Not too long ago, this fellow came forward at church. And he said, uh, I've already been baptized. Didn't know anything about him. I said, why were you baptized? You don't know? No, I don't know you. Well, I was baptized, he said, because uh, that's what we did at that church, and they just lined us up and baptized us. That's not scriptural baptism, friends. Scriptural baptism is understanding that you're lost, understanding God's law of pardon, and that is by faith. They cried out, many brethren, uh, what shall we do? That would imply faith, would it not? They heard, they believed it, they cried out, they were told to repent and to be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says that then they that glad to receive, receive his word were baptized, about 3,000 so. Didn't argue about it, they obeyed, they glad to receive it. Then you go to Acts chapter 10, and it's not a coincidence that God uses Peter again. You remember how he lets the tent, all the animals down in the tent to try to show, to convince the Gentiles or the Jews that the Gentiles could be saved? That was a real dividing point in the New Testament. How can we let the Gentiles in? They've got to be circumcised. Or, uh, you know, the, the big issue here is, uh, you know, we've been God's people for all these years and you're letting the Gentiles in? No, 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 that can't be right. And God had to perform a miracle uh, to convince not only Peter, but those that were present that the Gentiles could be saved. And then as he's talking to Cornelius, by the way, Cornelius is a good man, a devout man. He prayed, he gave alms, did all those good things. Very, very sincere fella. But yet, Acts eleven fourteen, he needed to hear words whereby he could be saved. You go to Acts 10. In Acts 11, and you'll see how Cornelius was saved, saved the same way that the Jews were in Acts 2. Somebody said, wait just a minute now. Cornelius and his household received the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, so therefore that saved him. Friends, the Holy Spirit was never given to a man to save him. I've had this discussion many, many, many times. I'm on several... Uh, 
different uh, Facebook, different uh, places where I'm uh, supposed to be the one to answer the questions. And most of the time, they say they're a member of the church, but I don't know how they ever got to be a member of the church with uh, very little they know. But oftentimes they'll say, well, how do we know that baptism is not Holy Spirit baptism? It could be spirit baptism. It can't be. In Acts, in AD 62, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, there's one baptism. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch said, Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He knew what it was. It was water. Water baptism. Holy Spirit baptism was a promise, and a promise can be received but never obeyed. Water baptism is a command that you don't receive it, but you obey it. And so, therefore, when Cornelius, and he commanded them to be baptized, it was the terms of where that Peter was using the authority or the keys to allow these people to become members of the body of Christ. Now, what are subjections we hear to this as we close? Number one, really, one church is just as good as another. My first work, when I got out of school, I went to Cordell, Georgia. I knocked on every door that I could down there and knocked on this door. And I said, I am from the First Street Church of Christ here in Cordell, Georgia. And they said, is this one, that one? No, it's not that one. It's First Street, over on First Street. Oh, okay. But it really, you know, this fellow saying, you know, it doesn't really matter where you go to church. You can just stay right here and have faith in your heart. And it, it, really, it really doesn't matter. And he said, by the way, churches were started by men. I said, no, not the Lord's church. No, no, no. The Lord's church was not. Listen to this, uh, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 10. To the, uh, principi- to the intent now that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church. Not the Masonic Lodge, not the Lions Club, not anything else. But by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, you know what? One denomination is just as good as another denomination. I would agree with that. But when you take the church that our Lord died for, he purchased a church with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28, are you not blaspheming God? Are you not just spitting in Jesus' face when you say one is just as good as another? When our Lord was willing to die on an old rugged cross for the salvation of mankind, and when he died that all men could be saved in his body, as he tells us? We'll look at that in just a moment. God planned this thing before the foundations of the world. And you're trying to tell me that the church is not really important? And brethren, I'm preaching this to our brethren too. If we really believe that the Lord's church, the church of the Bible, was what Jesus wanted us to be faithful to and uh, really be dedicated to, we do a better job sometimes than what we do. We have to beg and plead our, to our own brethren to be faithful. Listen, we, it is a privilege and an honor to be a member of the Lord's church. The one he died for, the one he loves. Not only that, we hear that sometimes. Well, can the New Testament really exist today? Why can't it? Luke 8, verse 11, when you take the seed, and the seed is the Word of God, and you take the seed of the kingdom, and you plant it in the hearts of men and women, why can't we have the same thing they had in the first century? We go into those villages in India, and we preach, we open up the Bible, and we preach uh, that the, what we're wanting to be today is exactly what they were in the first century. How are you going to do that? By not studying the Book of Mormon, by not studying some creed book, manual, and opinions of men, but open up the pages of the Word of God, preaching exactly what they preach, believing exactly what they believe, obeying exactly what they believe, then, brethren, we could be the same thing they were. I've studied a lot about the Reformation movement and the Restoration movement. I appreciate those men, and many of them gave their lives to what they thought was the right thing to do, and they wanted to leave Catholicism and go back to the Bible. They began the journey. They just didn't go far enough. And then the Restoration movement came along and said, uh, over close to where I live is the old Mulkey Meeting House. I love to go over there and just, we went to Philadelphia yesterday, the old Philadelphia building, and man, I just, my mind just go, what did those people have to go through? 
But they did that because they believed that the Bible was the seed, the Word of God. It was preached, and the people believed. What would it make you other than what it made them? And that's Christians. I'm not a Church of Christ Christian. I am a Christian. I am a member of the church that our Lord died for. You can be too. But doing exactly what they did. Number three, someone says, well, the church doesn't really, really save us. Who said the church saved us? Church doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. But the saved are in the church. Ephesians 5 verse 23. For as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. Colossians 1 18, Ephesians 1 22 and 23, the body is the church. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, when the end cometh, that is, the end of the world, this world's going to be destroyed. There's no such thing as rejuvenated earth and the heaven going to be on earth. No, 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 no. That's, that's another one of them fads that's coming through our brotherhood. The world's going to come to an end. It's going to be dissolved. There's going to be a judgment day. Then cometh the end, and he's going to take the kingdom, and he's going to deliver it to his father. Who do you think the kingdom is? Who's in the kingdom? Paul said that he had been delivered uh, from the power of darkness and translated in the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.13. Therefore, those that are in the church are in the kingdom, and those that are saved are in the church. Jesus saves us. Sometimes people think that we worship the church. We don't worship the church. We worship God. Somebody says, we put too much emphasis on the church. How can you separate the church and Jesus? How can you do that? Jesus is the Savior. We obey. We comply with his commands. When we obey the gospel, we're baptized into his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us that. If we're baptized into his body by one spirit and we're in the body of Christ, Colossians 1, 18, Ephesians 1, and 23, all the saved are in the body, then there are no saved outside of his body. If he's going to save the body, Ephesians 5, 23, what does that mean about those outside the body? If salvation could be found outside the body, then why is he just going to save the body? Now, the problem that we have is that we let our emotions start getting in the way. It was hard for me. I asked everybody underneath the sun all of these different questions. I got different answers. And there was an older lady that went to the church at Monterey, and she said, why don't you just read the Bible for yourself and do what the Bible says? She's exactly right. I'm thankful for Miss Irma, Miss Edna Pugh, as they were just showing me how important the truth is, the Bible is. Friends, if you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven because you know and understand the truth. The truth will make you free. John 8, 32, we talked about that yesterday. Somebody says, wait just a minute, you're being judgmental, you're being harsh. No, no, no. If you really knew me, you know better than that. I want everybody to be saved and go to heaven. If I had written the Bible, I may not have written it like God did. But I'm not God. I don't have the power and the ability to write a Bible. God, this is the Word of God, inspired by Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spake as they were moved, born alone by the Spirit. God knew best, and God knew exactly what he was going to do. And this is what God said before the foundation of the world. He came up with a plan. Jesus is the Savior. He's going to save those that obey him. He's going to put them in the body. Why? What's in the body? The body is the family of God. The body's the saved. What's important about this, the body, the family? That's that's where we have fellowship together. That's where we love one another. That's where we come together to worship God together in the family, in the body of Christ. Can't get to heaven without Jesus and without his church. That's the reason it's so important. Sometimes folks say, but maybe you're not looking at it the right way. Help me see it then. I've said this many times. I will change again if I am showed truth. Not your opinion, but truth. Because my friends, I want to go to heaven as much as anyone in here tonight. 
But to go to heaven, I've got to obey God. Somebody said, yeah, but you don't understand the grace of God. You don't understand the mercy that God's going to have. Uh, I heard a fellow pray the other day, and he said, Lord, we just pray on the day of judgment that you'll bestow your grace on us, your mercy on us, your grace on us. If you wait to the day of judgment to appropriate grace and mercy in your life, you waited too late. God is not going to be inconsistent with what he says right here in his will. He can't. If he saves you outside the body, he has to save everybody outside the body. Why? Because he is no respecter of persons. So if Jesus says all the saved are in the body, if the church is a pillar and ground of truth, there is no truth outside of his church, outside the scripture. Man, I appreciate that, don't you? I love the Lord's church. I have started making it a practice that I call it the Lord's church because of Matthew 16, 8. It's the Lord's church. I don't care what they do in all these up cities and all these schools and all these universities and all these liberals and all these modernists and all these skeptics and agnostics. They do whatever they want to, but my Bible is right. I'm going to go back to the Bible, and it is the church of our Lord that he said he would build. Salvation is in that body, and if I expect to go to heaven, I have not only got to obey the gospel, I've got to do exactly what they did in Acts 2.38. We had the building packed. It was on GBN, and I looked at that audience, and I said, how can you go wrong when you do exactly what they did in Acts 2.38? How in the world could that be wrong? Peter received the keys to the kingdom. He's binding something on earth. What did he bind? Repent and be baptized. This fellow says you don't have to do it. It's something you do after you say, where's the scripture at for that? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. 3,000, glad to receive his word. They were added to the church. How could that be wrong? Somebody says, well, you just don't know how God's going to judge. I know exactly how God's going to judge. John 12, 48, the words that I speak unto you, the same shall judge you in the last day. That's right. When people said, why did you leave your parents' religion? Why did you, and, and some of my family and cousins, you know, they, they, they make fun of me or they'll say something like, he's Church of Christ. You know, he left his family. No, I'm not. I'm a member of the Lord's church. I know it's right because I can read it in the Bible. You can be the same thing. Many of you are. I'm going to tell you something, friends. Those of us that are members of the Lord's church, you ought to love it with your, everything in your being. You ought to appreciate what our Lord went through that day. You ought to appreciate the fact in Ephesians 3 and 10 and 11, it was in the very mind of God. He purposed the church. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a substitute. It is the very body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ. And God gives you an opportunity to be in it. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. I have never regretted the day that I obeyed the gospel. Oh, there's been, there's been some tests here and there. There have been folks that's left the church, disappointed me, taught error here and there. It's always going. It happened in the New Testament days. Look at how many times that, that the writers had to write and try to keep brethren faithful and to remain faithful to the very end. And don't you listen to that one over there. Don't you follow after that one right there. Even practice church discipline that very few congregations practice today. But they did in New Testament days because the church, the Lord's church, had to remain pure. Couldn't be infiltrated with sin, habitual sin, that would bring shame upon the Lord's church. If you're not a Christian tonight, think about your soul. Think about how beautiful it is to be a member of the Lord's church. All we ask you to do is what they did in the first century. Faith cometh by hearing, by hearing the word of God. Friends, I don't care how long you pray for God to come into your life and to give you a sign that it's time for you to go to church and live right, you will never get it. You may have a feeling, but that feeling doesn't come from God. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. That's how faith is produced in the heart of man. And you must believe it. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. You must repent. 
The hardest part of salvation is re repentance. Coming to the point that, hey, I'm willing to change my lifestyle. I'm no, I'm no longer going to practice sin. I'm going to have a change of mind, change of will, change of action in my life. And then I'm going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I can remember one day standing up in a particular church and saying, I confess my sins. And they all prayed for me around a mourner's bench. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. I don't read any of that in the Bible. What I do read, though, is that God answers the prayers of the righteous. James 5, verse 16. His ears are open unto their prayers. 1 Peter 3, 12. You see, when you confess not your sins, you confess Jesus as the Christ. And you're baptized, there's nothing in that water that's going to save you other than by the eye of faith, the blood of Jesus will forgive you. Sometimes people call me water dog or call me a name. That, I don't even get into those arguments anymore. But I explain to them, no, you don't understand. It's the blood. The blood that was shed on Calvary for my sins and for your sins. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the Lord's church. You can do that tonight. If you're listening in days to come, call the church office here at Bobby Branch. Leave a message. And perhaps you need to come forward tonight. You've got sin in your life. I'm thankful for God's second law of pardon, aren't you? All we've got to do is repent and pray, acknowledge it before the congregation, let the brethren pray with you and for you that you once again might be in fellowship with him. Would you come while together we stand and as we sing? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white. here and tell you how much I thought of that sermon. The power, the uh, presentation was just simply there, and the truth was there. And I hope that you listen to that lesson. Hope you walk out of here with not only a determination to do what is right, but to teach what is right, and to try to encourage others to be obedient to the gospel. If you want to listen to this lesson again, it is available on both Facebook and YouTube. 
and it'll be on uh, Ben Loman tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And I encourage you to listen and to encourage others to listen. That's a great opportunity because you may have some family members who need to hear this lesson that was presented tonight. Brother Stanley's going to lead us in number 609. Terry with me. After that, Brother Bob is going to come and lead us in our dismissal prayer. And then afterward, I hope everyone enjoys some fellowship time and getting to greet and speak to one another. Brother Stanley. Carry with me, oh my Savior, for the day is passing by. Most loving, caring, gracious, forgiving Father. Father, we thank you so much that you loved us enough, that you wanted us to be with you enough to give the gift of your Son, to come and take our place and purchase our pardon. Father, we're so thankful for that gift. And we're thankful for the church that that blood purchased. Father, help us never to take this blood-bought family for granted. And Father, help us always to desire to be together and to show your love to all around us. Go with us now as we leave this place. Continue to watch over us and guide us. May we truly live for you. So we pray in Jesus' name, amen.